We have another great webinar for you today. Today's topic, uh, we'll be discussing creative strategies for increasing your network and deal flow during the pandemic. So it should be interesting. Uh, looking forward to getting to that conversation. But before we do, we have a few housekeeping matters that we want to go through. So my name is Lena Dobrir. I'm the Director of Operations at Opus Connect. We are a lower middle and middle market M&A focused organization. We are membership based. Uh, our members include private equity firms, investment bankers, lenders, independent sponsors, etc. We have chapters in Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, where typically we'd be holding uh, in-person monthly seminars. And in addition to those seminars, we do deal sourcing events, again, typically all around the country, uh, 15, 16 different markets, also in Canada. Um, so if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Opus Connect, feel free to reach out to my colleague, Jacob Zephyrin. His contact information is there at the bottom of the slide, and he'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, a quick note on Q&A, our panelists today will be taking live questions. So as they come to mind, uh, feel free to type them in that box at the bottom of your screen there that's labeled Q&A, our moderator. Uh, we'll be filtering through those and we'll, we'll try to get to as many as possible. So again, please submit those as they come to mind and, and we'll take them live. Um, these events, of course, would not be possible without the support of our sponsors. Uh, so we definitely want to give each of them a few minutes to introduce themselves in their firms. If they are not in the room, I will uh, briefly introduce them and then move on. But I do see Jim here with Avant advisory, so I definitely want to give him an opportunity to say a few words. Jim, please introduce yourself and your firm. Okay, thank you, Lena. I wasn't expecting that, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it's good. It's all good. Uh, happy to do it. Yes, uh, we're an M&A focused firm. In fact, we did, we've been doing in the last three or four years about 25 to 30 uh, M&A related transactions, all parts from front end due diligence, all the way through post-merger uh, acquisition disputes, uh, investigations and working capital true-ups, and even some litigation and arbitrations that, that follow on some of those that uh, were not successful. Uh, but now we're doing, uh, really doing a lot more in the distressed and even have a 365, uh, um, uh, sorry, section 360 transaction that's pending. Uh, and um, we do forensics, fraud, and corporate investigations. So anything m and related and a lot of related allied type financial advisory and consulting services. Thank you. Jim Davidson with Avant Advisory Group. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, I don't believe we have anybody from GemCap in the room. Also, if, if I happen to pass you by, feel free to raise your hand. There's a box at the bottom if, if you're a sponsor and I'll get to you. Uh, but GemCap Solutions, asset-based lender, they've been a, a longtime supporter of Opus Connect, so I definitely want to acknowledge them. We'll move on to the next sponsor here, which is Lawrence Financial. I don't believe Hayes or Larry are in the room today, but want to give them some acknowledgement. Uh, acknowledgement. Their contact information is below if you're interested or want to learn more. Sapien Investigations, David Kogan is not in the room. Again, want to acknowledge them. Please reach out if you have any questions. Uh, we'll move on to USI, Josh Goldberg, who again, I don't believe is in the room. I think everybody's very busy this morning, which is great. Um, so USI Insurance, LA chapter sponsor, please reach out to them. Uh, next is Four Degrees. And Ablorde is not on the phone. Uh, one of our newer sponsors. Uh, interesting firm, so definitely reach out to them if you want to learn more. Uh, Focus Search Partners, Steve Finder, are you here? I think this is the first time Steve is not in the room. Um, Steve Finder, Focus Search Partners. And last but not least, Resourceive, Nick Creasy, I see you. Uh, please introduce yourself and your firm. I think it's Cressy. I, I apologize. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's, that's nice. <laughs> uh, Nick Cressy, Managing Director at Resourcev. Thanks for having me. Resource is a firm of IT telecommunication subject matter experts. Primarily, we're supporting PE firms and their portfolio companies. Right now, the focuses are cost containment strategies, application performance, scalability, M&A navigation, integration, and obviously work from home with a focus on security and efficiency. So 
We do a no cost obligation audit and analysis, uh, basically turn around a rapid diagnostic check with, with industry and market benchmarking uh, and, and look for ways to, to save portfolio companies money at no out of pocket cost. Yeah, nice talking to everyone. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, before we get to the discussion at hand today, we have a couple audience poll questions we'd like to engage you with. So as you see this first question pop up on your screen, please contribute your answers. Um, how did you hear about today's event? Did you hear about it through us, a speaker, a sponsor, a LinkedIn? We just want to get an idea of how people are getting to our webinars. So appreciate your feedback there. We'll give it a, another five seconds or so, and then we'll move on. Great. Uh, so it looks like the team is doing their job. A lot of you heard about it from Opus Connect, our speakers and our sponsors as well. So again, thank you for your support. Uh, we'll move on to the last question here, which is helpful for us to know internally, but also uh, helpful for our panelists to know who's in the audience today. So which of these uh, best describes you, independent sponsor, investment banker, capital provider on the debt or equity side, service provider, or perhaps you fall into the other category. We'll give it another 10 seconds or so, and then we will move on. Great. So 32% uh, investment bankers, Next capital provider debt and equity side. I think a lot of you are, are participating in the deal connect directly following. So great to have you with us uh, for the first portion of today with the webinar. Without further ado, it is my great honor to introduce our founder and CEO, Lou Sokolovsky. I'm gonna step out and, and please take it away, sir. Thank you, Lena. Hi, um, I'm Lou Sokolovsky. I am with Opus Connect. Most of you interact with my colleagues. Um, so Opus Connect was launched, uh, I started 10 and a half years ago, with the idea to facilitate better, deeper, more productive relationships in the M&A community, enable private equity firms, investment banks, uh, independent sponsor, family offices to do better business development, network, and uh, uh, build real, really focus on relationships. So. Uh, this business development topic is very dear to me and definitely spending a lot of time uh, working with our uh, partners and clients on that. I think it was very interesting this morning what Lena just mentioned that um, I think seven out of our eight sponsors are not today. The market has been changing. So people adapting to new normal uh, at a fast rate and uh, oh, going back to some of the old uh, ways to do business and I would love to definitely hear from our um, uh, panelists and I would like to introduce them. So we'll start with Miss Rogers or Michelle. Uh, Michelle, introduce yourself and uh, um, take it away. Hey, good morning. Thank you, Lou. Uh, I'm Michelle Rogers. I, um, I spearhead business development at Corbell Capital Partners. We are a SBIC fund. Um, the, the firm began investing in 2014. We're currently investing out of a $350 million SBIC fund that was raised in 2017, uh, primarily targeting credit opportunities, but also providing minority equity. Um, we have a, a focus really on working with um, closely held owner operated businesses and family held businesses as well as independent sponsored companies. It's an interesting time to say the least. I think we're seeing a lot more opportunity to partner with other lenders as well as private equity funds, which hadn't historically been a strong focus for us, but um, we'll dive in deeper in the call. Um, what else can I tell you? We're lower middle market focused and um, you know, active members here in the Opus community and looking forward to talking more about business development. Thank you, Michelle. I uh, will go to Jack. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Jack Sadden, um, co-founder 
and partner with uh, Valesco Industries. We are a Dallas based firm, been around for over 25 years. Our first 15 years spent as an independent sponsor, and in the past 10 years, investing out of committed funds. Our current fund is a $300 million uh, small business investment company. Uh, our focus is on enterprise growth, development, and expansion of companies located throughout the US. Um, our focus has primarily been in uh, specialty manufacturing, value-added distribution, uh, what we call product-centric service businesses. They traditionally have a B2B vent to them. We also look at B2C in those cases where it's a non-fad or non-fashion related product. We're generally thought of as equity investors, but as an SBIC, a lot of flexibility in our capital commitments. We can be minority, we're often majority equity capital, or sometimes just debt. Typically, we're a mix of both. And as an added dimension to our capital commitments, most of our LPs are uh, commercial banks. They've provided 100% um, of our senior credit needs. Uh, so it gives us kind of a one-stop feel. Uh, our uh, typical size of business is revenues of 10 to $100 million. EBITDA is greater than $3 million. The farther away from Dallas, Texas yard, the larger we like that EBITDA to be, but uh, we, we are pretty flexible and open-minded uh, beyond the small business model. Uh, minimum check size, $10 million. We generally like to write a check of 15 to 22 million on an initial commitment. Um, and as far as things that we're uh, typically going to steer away from, uh, financial services, energy, EMP, commodity uh, turnarounds and uh, overly story deals are things that we shun. But aside from that, we have a very open and flexible approach to our partnership with our, uh, our, our company and management teams. Thank you, Jack. Appreciate it. Uh, Britt. Hello. Um, my name is Britt Terrell, Backbone Capital, based in Los Angeles. Let's see, I've known Lou for the 10 years. So this is the first time Lou's stepped in front of the camera as the moderator. So Lou, thanks for uh, leading That's our That's my debut, uh, yes. Today. Thank you for being <laughs> um, my gifts. Right. Backbone is a capital raising advisor, raising senior debt, junior debt, minority structured equity. On occasion, we're raising control equity, lower middle market. Um, a lot of the deals that we do do the SBICs are sort of the right, you know, size zone, structure zone of capital raises that we're doing. Sometimes deals are, you know, negative EBITDA and we're raising ABL um, really all over the place in terms of cap structure. We don't drive sell side mandates, but on occasion we are arrang arranging control equity. So um, doing deals all over the nation, probably 80% of what we do is acquisition financing. So um, again, 80% uh, 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 that, and then the other 20%, some type of restructuring of existing balance sheet, financing direct companies direct. Um, so happy to help out. Thank you, Britt. Last but not least, Tom. Hello, thanks Lou. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tom Nugent. Uh, I'm probably a bit different than most of the uh, participants, uh, given my background. I started off as an operator. I like to say I'm a reformed operator. Uh, ran uh, businesses for several large companies, first of which was uh, the Timken Company, uh, heavy industrial products, uh, bearings and, and gears. Uh, then moved on later to uh, Mars, ran part of their uh, electronics group. Uh, Mars sold that electronics group off to Bain Capital, which was the first heavy involvement I had in uh, the private equity space. Uh, after leaving that investment, uh, when it was sold back in 2014, uh, I moved into the role of an independent sponsor. That's where I uh, got to know Lou a bit. We got on famously and we, we share the same haircut. Uh, and Lou had introduced me to a number of individuals uh, uh, from investment bankers to others in, in the, uh, the investment world. 
Um, currently, uh, about two years ago, I began working with Thingston Partners uh, in, uh, in a consulting capacity. Um, I've known Thingston for closing on 20 years now and uh, recently hung up my hat as an independent sponsor and joined Thingston full time. Thingston uh, is a, uh, a middle market private equity fund uh, investing in everything from uh, the, the, the standard range of two to, to 15 million of EBITDA. Uh, we're heavy into uh, add-ons. Almost every single portfolio company has multiple add-ons uh, as part of our, our growth uh, approach. And we invest in industrial manufacturing service and parts distribution uh, in a broad range of uh, investments. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. So we're gonna do uh, gonna go following way. We I wanted to give everyone um, starting point. I'll, we'll go around uh, the group and give everyone a background on your business development efforts before COVID to have a uh, point of reference. And we'll spend on that 10 minutes, maybe you know, two minutes each person. What we did before it worked. It worked great. You know, this is how we did it. And then we'll go after COVID. What we adapted from those uh, those uh, strategies, and uh, and what we're doing new, and what we like and what we don't like about the new environment, because we definitely uh, uh, I, I don't think anyone had a contingency plan for something like that. We had contingency plan for recessions, for hurricanes, for a number of different issues, but I doubt it. I don't know anyone that had a contingency plan for something of that scale. So right. obviously it was a big surprise and, you know, we getting a lot of interesting feedback from our um, members about how they reacted and it has changed a lot in the last two months, but, you know, we'll start, uh, Tom, we'll start with you. We'll go backwards. We'll start with you. So tell us more about your efforts up to COVID and then, you know, we'll go around and talk about post COVID. I mean, COVID. Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, prior and after COVID, there's, there's, the processes are similar, but the, the balance is, is very different. So uh, some very, very standard processes, the first of which is we employ industry initiatives. Uh, we have very specific industries that we find interesting for various reasons, market growth, um, where the industry we believe is he headed, technology protection, IP. Uh, and we're continuing to follow, you know, uh, processes like in industry initiatives. Uh, we do direct reach out to executives. This is probably something that as we are engaged right now, we're doing more of. We're seeing more executives coming direct to us, uh, executives with ideas. Uh, and since we have less time on airplanes, we're spending more time reaching out to uh, executives, perhaps also within these uh, uh, industry initiatives. Um, more engagement with investment bankers. I think, uh, you know, that continues. Uh, but uh, one of the things I've taken on being one of the new, uh, being the new guy at, uh, uh, at Fingston is bringing in my investment banking uh, relationships that I've had, for example, out in LA, uh, Jane's Capital uh, did not have a, you know, a, a regular relationship with, with uh, Fingston and brought them in and, and number of different investment bankers were creating new relationships. Um, probably, uh, we've always used buy side firms, uh, especially in add on acquisitions, uh, still heavy engagement with buy side firms going, going forward. And I think one of the, the things we continue to talk about and we are engaging and spending more time on is attempting to find carve outs. So carve outs with, uh, large multinational organizations where they're finding something doesn't fit and perhaps they're in uh, need of cash in the short term. Thank you, Tom. You, you managed to cover almost both questions very well. I'm sorry Thank about you. that. No, no, it's even better. It's, you did it so concisely. I appreciate it. Breed, you know, give us your background, you know, cover the what you did before and kind of introduce what you're doing now, but we'll go more deep in what you're doing now. Will do. So Backbone is a small shop, right? So historically, it's been primarily myself. Um, you know, I use my own contacts. I've had Microsoft Outlook. Um, my background via old Foothill days, 
Gore's group, et cetera, have contacts in that area. I focus a lot on independent sponsors and smaller buyout groups. So I continue to network those areas. Obviously, Southern California is my hub, but try to be as national as one person can, can be. Um, certainly participate in um, organizations such as OPUS um, and others, participate in conferences and one-on-one, -on -one, you know, deal connect sessions. Um, but it's a one-man hustle, frankly. So um, what's happened in the COVID world, and maybe it's a little bit, you know, uh, uh, fortuitous in timing, um, but I brought on a new principal onto my firm at the beginning of the year. So that's been very helpful. Someone, you know, smart, young, experienced, very good. So one of our first things is to implement a CRM system. So that may be very standard for most people in this audience and on this panel, but for Backbone, it's new. So we, we just implemented that and we did it wise and we took the time to do it right and it has to be organized or it's a big mishmash. So we, we, we were careful about it and now that's implemented. In fact, you know, hopefully many of you got an email from me yesterday uh, just uh, uh, presenting this event. So it is easy to do that now versus what it, what, it, what, it, what it was. But having this additional member allows us to be more broad. Um, also, he was a former CFO in uh, consumer products goods um, in the snack food space. So you know, he has a specialty that we can reach out directly to operating companies. But look, it's difficult for a small shop to reach out to operating companies. So there's still a lot of ideas brewing about how to do that other than simply, you know, refreshing your contacts, reaching out to, you know, stale contacts that you just, for whatever reason, haven't been kept fresh. So that's all old school stuff that we still need to do. You can't forget about that. And, you know, when you see a name in your contacts, I, I actually just send them an email, just checking in what's going on. So there, there's still a lot of the old school tactics that you that you need to do. And especially, you know, all the events were shut down, right? I mean, you know, if you, we were signed up for two different events in April and then in June, both are shut down. Um, what are we doing about that? Well, there are attendee lists for those events. So we're reaching out to those attendees, trying to, you know, still maintain the purpose of what the conference was to be, to still um, make re reach out, make those contacts, and uh, 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 um, you know, try to build our network and keep keep abreast. There's a lot of evolution going on in the marketplace and with firms, um, keeping abreast of who's doing what, opportunities that are brewing out there. So it, it's still a one-on-one -on -one thing. I, I, you know, just having a CRM to blast, you know, and blitz emails is, is not a strategy. Um, it's a helpful technical tool, but building relationships one-on-one, -on -one, and, and I think most would agree, is still the primary, you know, goal. And um, yes, you have to be skilled at what you do, but building relationships one by one is a still slow, methodical process having various tools to help you do that more efficiently is obviously what the goal is. So we can, I can relate to that. When COVID happened, we, we were working on a few new technologies, implementations. So we launched them, both the VDR virtual data room that now part of Opus Connect membership and our deal platform. And it's been in work for like nine months, but COVID hit and we're like, okay, done. We're going in and we finally launched that. We actually got two questions for Breed about uh, what's, which CRM system did you use? Did you implement? We reviewed a few. Uh, I will tell my, my new principal did most of the legwork on this, but we ended up with a Zoho. Zoho, okay. Okay, good, good. Uh, we'll go to Jack. Thank you, Breed. I appreciate it. So, uh, Lou, I'm going to pick up on your theme. Uh, th this is our first pandemic. So uh, it was never in any of our storm planning. We regularly include storm planning 
not only in what Valesco does, but we do that with each of our partners and portfolio companies. And to your point, uh, none of us ever baked into any of those storm plans a zero revenue model. Right. Um, fortunately, uh, uh, not all of our companies were affected that way. In fact, most of them have done pretty well through this. But on the question of business development, as I mentioned in my introduction, historically, uh, or our roots, uh, were that of an independent sponsor. And uh, in those years and the time leading up to when Bud and I became partners, um, direct or um, origination that was initiated by us on a proprietary basis was really our stock and trade. A hundred percent of our investments in our first 15 years of business, save one deal, came from uh, a process of going directly to targeted companies and targeted markets and initiating and originating our own uh, relationships. So we were essentially doing uh, buy side search for ourselves. And so I would tell you that as we look back historically, um, and moved into the more recent years, why 85% of our deal flow at the top of the funnel has come from the investment banking and referral communities. When you looked at what we were closing, 40% of our closes still emphasized direct origination um, and another 27% come from our relationships with independent sponsors. Um, we really value that community and think that that partnership uh, works to our advantage and strength and our background as independent sponsors plays well to our partnership with them. And then uh, I also mentioned bank LPs is a big part of our, our partnership circle. They represent nearly 10% of uh, the closes that we've had over the past 10 years. So. Um, although uh, numerically, the number of opportunities we see comes from indirect sources, when we get to closes, it's still dominated by our direct activities. So where we are today, um, I would say that we haven't changed as much as we've maybe uh, just uh, revisited or reemphasized uh, the direct community. We think that in the current market, the, the auction process is not going to go away. In fact, uh, many of our friends uh, in the investment banking community continue to report that they're getting closes done. We're really excited and encouraged by that. And we're seeing that deals are still being brought to market. But there is a shift. Um, companies uh, that were in auction have been taken off market. A few things coming through. So we think that um, we're going to have a disruption in buyouts, um, but we think that there is an increase in opportunities to support companies in other ways. Minority equity, uh, debt for shoring up balance sheets, good companies and challenged balance sheets because of the current circumstances, as well as I think that the current circumstance in many cases brings um, privately held entrepreneur companies to conclude different things. And when they come to market, they may not be looking for the full sale of their business, but having an appetite to take on a partner, try out new things. And so flexible capital structures, a big focus on uh, performance and enterprise enhancement. Um, and those are really more about emphasis or a change of emphasis than what I'd call a wholesale change in strategy for us. You, you beautifully addressed another question that I had to follow up and I'll ask everyone, you know, how did you change your product mix, service mix to address new needs and you address the minority equity. So uh, we'll, we'll go deeper into that, but I um, appreciate it, Jack. This was great. Thank you. Uh, Miss Ro Mrs. Rogers, we'll go <laughs> to you. I mean, I want to echo what others have said already, you know, I think that, you know, to, to what Jack said, we're doing a lot of the same things, but um, augmented. Give us more color on what, what strategies was sure. really like the core. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, so, I'd say, so I'd say pre-COVID, um, 
a lot of what we were doing is, you know, similar to, to what other folks do. Um, but I think Corbell does have a few niches where we're a little bit differentiated. Um, a lot of our deal flow comes from investment bankers and independent sponsors. So we've spent um, a lot of effort marketing to those groups with um, outbound calling, um, a rhythm, you know, we have a list of contacts in our CRM that we're proactively calling on on a 60, 90 day schedule to make sure that we are staying top of mind. So that's very important in business development is just, um, you know, folks have a deal that fits your strategy, maybe once or twice a year at most. And so they need to remember, you know, what your appetite is. That's very important. Um, a lot of our deal flow has actually come in from uh, proprietary networks and, and personal referrals to my partners. Um, my, my colleague Jeff has been in the private equity, private equity sector for 20 years. He was at Aries, he was at Gore's. He actually sees a lot of local deal flow. Um, and we've had, uh, we've had success there in closing deals. Um, we also would attend the financial conferences and industry conferences. So going to, you know, an Opus Connect event, an ACG event. Um, we actually attend quite a few industry conferences, though Corbell is a generalist. You know, we're more, I think, driven by deal dynamics more so than anything. And we're very much, you know, opportunistic and we'll look at just about any industry. There's really only a couple of um, industries that are a no-go for an SBIC fund, but you know, for the most part, we're, we're trying to solve for yes. And we'll, we'll look at um, anything from, you know, healthcare to business services to, you know, aerospace and defense is actually a sector we've had quite a bit of success in. Um, and what I describe as mature technologies um, and then healthcare, actually, we have three investments in healthcare. Um, and, and those are areas where we've seen some good flow. We actually have um, outside operating advisors that um, help us to diligence opportunities. Um, we have one operating advisor, David Grooms, who has served as a CEO and is currently serving as a CEO at one of our portfolio companies. Um, so a little bit more, uh, I'd say, ability to roll up our sleeves and get involved with our borrowers than other lending SBIC funds or lending focused SBIC funds. But that is not a requirement of our loan. It's more of a value added partnership. Um, we have also spent time doing uh, marketing trips to cities. So we've identified um, specific cities where we have uh, a network and we've seen good flow from, um, and also cities that we want to build a, a, a larger network and see more flow from. So we'll visit, you know, tier one cities twice, three times a year. We'll visit tier two cities, you know, once or twice a year. And we are constantly, you know, revolving that. This is all pre-COVID. So it'll be interesting to see how this, how this morphs post-COVID. Um, you know, we also produce marketing brochures and case studies with a lot of detail on how we structure deals um, and how we've been, you know, kind of a value added partnership on deals. What exactly, what kind of strategies we implemented to help maximize value for the owner of the business that went to do a, a sale after taking on our growth capital. Um, we've also done a lot of panel participation. This is something I strongly advocate for within my organization is finding panels we can participate on is really one of the best ways to get your name out there and to get folks, um, you know, listening to your strategy. Um, and then an, another personal um, uh, strategy that I've relied on that has given me a lot of success over my career is referring deals that aren't a fit. So I get deals in all the time that are majority recaps, change of control transactions. Um, you know, maybe it's an industry where we've already we already have um, you know dollars deployed, and we, we we're not looking to um, you know invest more dollars into that sector. You know. The, that's gold. When I can refer a deal that is solid and it's an interesting opportunity, but isn't a fit for my strategy, um, that comes back tenfold to my other um, lending friends and private equity friends and independent sponsors as well. You know, they think 
the next time that they have a deal. Um, and then we also do email marketing. Um, we actually implemented a new email marketing service that allows us to track um, you know, clicks, what people are, are, are um, hyperlinking and what, are, what they're clicking on, how many times they're opening our email. Um, and we actually use that list to then go out and reach out to people. If somebody you know, opened our email 12 times and clicked on our, our URL, half a dozen times, we might ping them and say, hey, you know, wanted to catch up if it's been a little while since we connected with them. This is great, Michelle. Thank you. Um, so yeah, uh, you guys address some of the changes, you know, that you already implemented or still using strategies that you used in the past. But I want to go, what have you done in the last two and a half months, in the last what, 10, 11 weeks since this happened? Uh, what, what, what has not worked? And also in terms of um, contingency plans, what are your, if this continues for next, probably at least six, maybe up to 24 months, like in event business, for example, I was in, at a round table with a bunch of uh, CEOs of companies like Opus Connect, and some are not planning any events till summer of 2022, not 2021, 2022. We probably not gonna have events for some time, our Deal Connect events went virtual. We adapted quite well. It worked out well. We're building, a, we're moving our company from being an event company to being more of a technology company and you know business development outsourcing our, to you, to you guys. So it's uh, we're working on a contingency plan that we might not have an event for the next 24 months. And I'll give us, tell us what you have done. Tell us what you're considering to do for next 24 months, taking you know, off maybe up to five minutes each. We have, uh, uh, actually we don't have four minutes each. I guess we need to wrap up in 21 minutes. So uh, so I have a last round, like, you know, where I need 30 seconds from each. So let's take three, four minutes each and let's uh, give us more color. Again, I'm pretty sure you guys sat down with your teams and strategize. So I don't know, Brit, we'll start with you and then we'll go around. Yeah. So, um... A few things. One is the restructuring world is an area that I play in. Not everybody does, but that's an area that I, I need to be, you know, continuously active in. So we are reaching out to restructuring firms. Now, many restructuring firms will do both the operational restructuring as well as the balance sheet restructuring. So if they do all that in one shop, then um, okay. But for those groups that are strictly operating oriented, we're trying to plug into them to let them know that, hey, we can be that balance sheet restructuring component while you are the operating restructuring element. So as much so it's as- it's a new opportunity that COVID brought to you. You could, you know, th I mean, that's a growing I, I would mark. Say, I would say that it enhanced it. You know, enhanced. I, I have always tried to do that um and maybe not as deep and don't penetrate as much as i should be but again now there's there's a lo broader team here at backbone and now there's just much more of a restructuring environment versus the last six years right, right. so <clears throat> back in 09 i was at gore's right i started backbone in 2011 so there's always restructuring of some nature going on somewhere so yes it's been a important part of backbone strategy but obviously right now is the first significant moment over the last few few months so we now admittedly the restructuring folks are very busy right now so uh they sort of have less less time for chit chat but as far as you know i can add real value to their team to help out in a situation so i'm i am doing that um you know, continuous reach out obviously is, is, is important. But you said, what if this goes, you know, continues longer and longer? So think of things like in September, there's the Los Angeles ACG. There's usually, it's the big event in LA for the m and You do a big event during that time as well. Yeah, Opus is right there. Can, you know, and I, we I do, do event, We do event around that time, yeah. A lot of people do that. So what's happening with that? You know, that's 2000 people you know, a fourth of them from Southern Cal, the other three quarters flying in from all over the place. Uh, everybody's got meetings going on. Well, I don't know if that's happening or not right now. And everybody's, you know, making contingency plans. So 
does that become virtual in a similar way that something like Opus has already perfected, frankly, already? So congrats to you, Lou, on uh, sort of pivoting very swiftly and eloquently, frankly. So will they do the same for that event? I don't know. So here we are in June, that's in September. Um, but we are still planning, what will we be doing? You know, as far as Backbone, we have our big annual event at the same time. So it'll be somewhat smaller and somewhat, you know, we're still working on that. So, but, but anyways, I mean, there are questions that I don't have the answers to, but obviously we are going to do the same we believe we're gonna still be relevant, that the more challenging situations continue, which is where we tend to specialize the most, um, we, we believe we will still be relevant. So we will continue to reach out to as many people as we possibly can. Um, again, we're a small team, we don't have access to all the tools, but you know, Microsoft Teams, we're, we're screen sharing, you know, uh, um, Zoom obviously is a, is, a, is, a, is a tool. So we, we will just continue to do that. And then I just think of deals that I'm working on right now. I mean, there was two deals I had in March. One died a COVID death. The other one, revenues are stable and we're going forward and we signed a term sheet this week on the deal and we're hoping to close in July and plowing through. Look, it was, I'm out in the market in March and April. And of course, two thirds of the people are just saying, you know, Britt, what are you doing? Uh, we're very busy on managing our portfolio. Um, so- Britt, yeah. uh, I know, you know, you have pretty sizable network nationally in here. And it's something that I wanna ask everyone else to maybe address quickly. It's, it's okay to maintain relationship virtually but through Zoom, it's harder to build new ones. What's your experience in building brand new relationship and what's your strategy maybe for next yeah, sure. potentially. A lot, of, a lot of groups that are, are splinter groups off of bigger funds. So new independent sponsors being created. Mm -hmm. So I try very hard to stay in touch with them. Probably someone that I knew before, but they're in a new logo right now. So how to reach out. Again, events like today's Opus Connect one-on-one -on -one meetings, um, other conferences that have gone virtual, try to do those one-on-one -on -one meetings. It, it, it's really, you know, expanding the network by, you know, guerrilla approach every way possible. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brett. Tom, we'll go to you. Great. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, quite a laundry list of, of things and activities uh, that are both at play or could be at play if we need to go uh, deeper. So we talked about distressed deals. Uh, several of you have, have uh, actually participated in distressed deals. And uh, we expect that uh, some things will emerge and emerge quickly. Where do you find those? Uh, quite frankly, they may come through all the, the standard sources, but what about uh, uh, auditing firms? Uh, we've reached out to several, uh, whether it's Deloitte, KPMG, whomever, uh, that have clients that they know that perhaps uh, financially have not made it through the uh, um, the COVID situation or the current uh, chaos that's going on. Um, back the executives. So a, a number of different firms try the back the executive model. We've done it a little bit in the past, but we're finding displaced executives beginning to emerge. So we have executives, usually one, two, three different uh, resumes that are popping up uh, every week. So what's your idea? I just received this morning a uh, a two-page thesis statement from an executive that says he's got some ideas, he's got companies that uh, he'd like to go after. Um, talking about carve-outs, so carve-outs from, from uh, every Fortune 1000 company, or not every, uh, but a lot of Fortune 1000 companies uh, uh, have a department such as a strategy development. I was part of that in, in, in my background. And reaching out to them, there's going to be some segment of their business that either no longer fits their strategy or also that they're looking for cash for for slower operations. Uh, so corporate carve outs are something that I think uh, could be very interesting. Um, add ons, add ons, add ons. Are you, are you just reaching out to those guys directly? What's your strategy? How to, to do Again, it goes back to our industry thesis of things that we like. So when we say we like something in X, 
uh, we identify three, four, five uh, large companies. And I talk to some people from uh, 3M as an example, talk to their uh, uh, corporate strategy team, what's working, what are they doing, and do they have any? They didn't, you know, at the time, they, they didn't have anything. But it's, uh, knocking on each of those doors, uh, it, it only takes one of those calls to, uh, to turn into a potential portfolio company. Um, add-ons, add-ons, add-ons is also important to us. We usually have two or three add-ons for every portfolio company. And right now we're using buy-side firms, uh, specific buy-side firms that has something perhaps in an industry, creating relationships. Here's what we're looking for. And they're, unfortunately, uh, it, uh, maybe not the right term, but let's say dialing for dollars. They are out there reaching out to everybody in the industry to find if somebody might be uh, uh, interested at this at this time. Um, and another strange thing that I, I have personally employed is going to universities. We're finding if you've got an industry or a segment uh, that is technology backed, uh, I've talked to two different MIT grads, uh, one a, a PhD that's uh, teaching at the moment, and talk to them. What are they seeing in their areas of expertise? Do they see any organizations. Uh, we normally don't do anything from, from a startup perspective, but they might find something that's already, uh, you know, post-entrepreneur or entrepreneurially led that uh, could be something that we uh, create a connection and, and find an opportunity. So those are some of the ideas and things that we have active and some that uh, uh, are on the plate should we need to, to pull them out. So that's going to be that new things that you want to do with college. Yes. Right? Interesting, very creative ideas. And Tom and Jack, both of you guys used to be operators, independent sponsors, and then became private equity guys. So I would guess two of you very different from typical private equity professional that came from investment banking route that you probably connect with those strategy guys, I would guess differently. Yes. You know, there is more of a bond, especially you did that. To Unfortunately, gray hair connects with gray hair. Um, or no hair. So uh, it's good when you can talk through with an operator, uh, those kind of backgrounds. Jack got here by mistake, actually, you know, with his hairstyle, but you know, it's, there's a consistent theme on this panel, except obviously Michelle and Jack. Jack, we'll go to you and then we'll go to Michelle. Sure. So um, I'll try and be additive to <clears throat> what everybody else has already shared. Um, Lou, we're a small business investment company and we try and take uh, that license um, uh, and that the message and the mission that goes with it pretty seriously. The SBA, I think, has been really clear in its desire to see SBICs um, be activists in uh, the current set of circumstances. And what that translated to us was, um, I think everybody's had some great ideas about where you go and a lot of it to me um, strikes me as a lot of direct activities. And so um, we're doing those things too. But what we spent a lot of our time thinking about was um, what, what's our message and what are we bringing to the game? Um, it's, it's not enough to call up and say, hey, I'm a private equity guy and don't you wanna to talk to me? Uh, people are uh, going through this the first time uh, there's a lot of uh, feeling of isolation, of insecurity, a lack of vision. Uh, heck, we don't even know when we're going to get to the other side of this thing. So we felt it would be very important that we thoughtfully message um, what it is we can do to help and support. Um, a big part of uh, our roots, as you already touched on and Tom discussed it as well, is it's, a, it's about performance and what can we do to bring game to a small business, privately held entrepreneur company. Um, things that we're doing on the technology front. Um, we we uh, have been launching, in the process of launching, a series of videos. Uh, they're animated videos and they're intended to speak to the things that a small business entrepreneur owned company finds important. Everything from legacy to risk management to partnership uh, to team building, to dominating in your marketplace, to expanding and uh, growing your business, uh, to um, performance and how to drive uh, results uh, through, through better performance techniques. 
And so we think these are all relevant topics, particularly now. The common denominator or the table stakes for us is the money that we bring to the table. So we believe that the real message needs to be, what can I do for you? What can I do to make your life better, different, special by including me in a partnership with you? So we think it's about carrying that message to the market and the way in which we're doing it, uh, we're, we're hopefully using um, tools and techniques that will speak to the moment um, remotely uh, using, um, as I said, videos and uh, e-technologies and social media as the tools to get ourselves introduced. And then, uh, like I said, thoughtfully scripting what it is we can do to help improve a company when we get there. Can I tell more about social media? It's interesting. Uh, not a lot of private equity firms use social media, if you don't mind sharing. I did not know about it. Yeah. Um, in fact, what I'm going to do is, uh, I thought Michelle gave such a nice response to that the other day. I, I'm not going to steal her thunder because she actually has a better program than I do. Um, but we do use social media. Uh, most of what we do, however, is uh, more targeted and more customized uh, rather than what I'd call blanketing and, and broadcasting. So uh, I will tell you that we take a very targeted approach and I think I'll defer to uh, Michelle to maybe talk a little bit about how she's using um, uh, uh, media to her advantage uh, in the avenue you're talking about. Sure. Thank, yeah. thank you, Jan. Yeah, Michelle, you have unique role. You really, you know, compared to other, like we have a lot of diversity on our panel. Your full job, full time job is business development. You're not doing deals. And the business development is not kind of you doing on the side. You're really strategic, and you drive force. You know, with your new team, you joined them with a year ago. You're really driving the force them to do more things, and I start seeing your guys a lot more out there than I seen them yeah. before. Uh, so tell us, you know, like how, what do you have done in the last ten weeks, and what's you know what's your plan going forward, and if you could cover social media as well, it would be great. Absolutely. Yeah, no, we, um, you know, we weren't prepared for a shutdown shelter in place across the country. I don't think anybody was. Um, and there's still more to be revealed about how it's going to affect um, our industry and small businesses and, and, and large businesses um, across the country. Um, you know, my husband has a small business and I've seen his company be impacted. I don't think there's one company, um, you know, today that any one of us would be, um, you know, uh, a fit for that doesn't need some sort of um, incremental financing. You know, I think it's just, it's, I think there's a little bit of a pause going on right now with the triple P pro program and the main street loans um, and the, the stimulus packages that are, that are, you know, being revised weekly. Um, I think there's a little bit of a bandaid that's been put on a much larger problem. Um, and I think we'll probably be seeing a lot more um, what we call need to do deals in Q3 and Q4. Um, and I think that that's going to be the time where SBIC funds and not, you know, private credit funds basically are going to have um, a lot of opportunity to, you know, invest dollars. We've been in a very frothy market for a very long time. It's been very difficult to find um, good risk adjusted return opportunities. Um, and you're probably going to see a lot of pullback from the banks and from the BDCs. So, um, you know, right now we are really leveraging existing relationships. Um, we are becoming a lot more focused and organized. We have a running BD call that I actually would be on right now if I wasn't on this panel, but we're getting together as a firm every- That's a new thing. That's a new thing. That's a new thing, yeah. It's, it's basically a two hour phone call um, you know, every Thursday, you know, we also have our, our regular investment committee calls throughout the week, but we are getting on a phone call and discussing BD strategy, you know, you know, who, who's reaching out to who, um, you know, 
who has a portfolio that we think could could aid could could, could benefit from um, some some additional financing. So you know we're being very thoughtful and strategic about who we're reaching out to. We're analyzing others' portfolios and seeing where we may be able to have um, a competitive edge. We've produced um, COVID-specific marketing materials that we're sharing with um, different different um, different groups. So, like investment banks, um, independent sponsors, funded sponsors. We have specific COVID-19 marketing materials for them. Um, and you know we're we're it's still trial and error. We're, we're still trying to figure it out. How can we be um, proactive? You know, I'm I'm still a little stumped on you know the whole building new relationships in this environment. I agree, that's very tough. I'm very much a person that needs to put a face to the name in order to remember somebody's name. I just I'm a very visual person, um, so that that will be challenging. But I think at the end of the day. If there's a good deal that needs to get done, um, you know that those are the deals that are that the need to do deals is what's going to be, um, I think, the types of deals that we're going to be seeing um, completed in 2020. It's it's, it's going to be more kind of you know restructuring opportunities that are going to be coming through the pipeline. Yes, it's and for social media. Sorry, I almost forgot. Yeah. Um, I do rely on LinkedIn. Um, I'm very much, you know, very proactive with LinkedIn. Um, you know, reaching out to to folks in a very kind of like tailored way. I think you know, there's a finite group of people in our industry, and so you need you do need to be very tailored in your approach um, when contacting folks. Um, and I think that you know, know your audience. You know. For for kind of younger deal professionals, I will use LinkedIn to reach out. But if it's you know more of a, a senior level member of the team um, that I don't think may be as proactive with LinkedIn, you know I'll definitely um, you know lob in a phone call or email them directly. I appreciate Michelle. Yeah, it's a very common theme. Like people want to shake hands. That's how they used to do things. But if for a year or two we have the restriction on meeting in person one way or another, how to build those new relationships, that's a big challenge. And I'll tell you from my experience, um, we have actually managed to build a few new partnerships with people we never met in the last two and a half months. And I think people, people's expectations were like, it is new normal, I don't need to meet you. Sounds right, let's do it, let's sign an, an agreement and we have done it. Uh, actually, I, I'm big on LinkedIn as well as Michelle, um, we started to use this new software to manage our LinkedIn, my, my LinkedIn and my colleagues as well. So that can be a very helpful tool. Uh, we running out of time. We actually run out of time. So it's going to be super quick. Uh, one question from the audience. There's a few questions, but one that um, special pride equity guys, uh, uh, it was addressed to them. Uh, hold on how it was phrased. Uh, the new EBITDA C. What does it mean to you? Then you know to how do you look at EBITDA C? So I'll jump in because I, I think that this is you know related to how we're valuing uh, portfolio companies as also acquisitions. Uh, so right. it's it is a, uh, a a strange debate and discussion as to how we're going to do that. Um, Looking at things, the deals that are coming in, we know that there is uh, a, a specific curve and a downplay. Uh, in which cases can we ignore that? In which cases do we need to assume that there's a, a new plateau? Uh, and the same goes for our portfolio companies of will they return and how can we go about uh, using the same kind of analytics uh, to provide a new val valuation methodology? I'll build on what Tom's saying in that, that is, um, there are so many unexpected uh, outcomes, businesses that I would have thought would perform extremely well, maybe not doing so much, other businesses that we thought would be hugely impacted to the negative, actually showing 
signs and opportunities for growth and outperform prior year. So um, I don't think there's a blanket answer to valuation uh, or what we're going to do to adjust EBITDA. I think it's extremely case by case driven and it has to be not only case by case, but to the extent that you are going to concede uh, an adjustment related to COVID, there are a set of sub facts and circumstances that will drive that analysis. So no blanket answer other than to say the, the pandemic um, is profound. Uh, it's broad based. Uh, it's going to continue for the foreseeable future and be a part of our lives. So therefore, it's just got to be a part of the narrative as well as part of the evaluation uh, and conclusions you draw. And, and I'll just add to that, too. It's a really interesting question, um, especially to a lender, um, because we analyze, you know, historical financial performance to underwrite our loans. And, um, you know, it's it, what is considered a backwards view on performance has been the conservative approach. Now, it's not so much the conservative approach. If anything, it's the opposite. You know, trying to look at com a company's past performance, you know, pre-COVID is, is going to be, you know, um, not the way to underwrite loans going forward. And it really is a case-by-case -case basis, but it's, it's a really interesting question. Instead of LTM, it's uh, what happened last month. That's... Yes, Dif different times. I, I, it's what... I don't know how many standard deviation away we're from the mean now. More, definitely more than six. Um, we run out of time, but I have three quick questions. So if you can just guys kind of use one word to address them. The C we've got actual bunch of questions about CRM. I already asked Grid about which one he's using, but others ask which ones you guys use. If you can tell us about your CRM new hobby that you picked during this time and next time you'll be willing to jump on a plane to meet someone okay so real quick i'll take it from the top we use salesforce have been for a while uh, we've used crm uh, in in different fashions with different applications uh, salesforce at the moment seems to be satisfying our needs best uh, hobbies um, I've always been a closet case restaurateur, Lou. So I've been working on my culinary skills. Uh, my wife loves it. And uh, I've managed to figure all that out and uh, eat better and lose weight all at the same time. So uh, <laughs> we're, we're working on the trifecta there. Uh, next time we're gonna get on an airplane. Uh, I got some good news this morning from one of our companies, uh, Drug Free Sport. We've been spending a lot of time in and around different technologies that are emerging around COVID and, and battling this uh, insidious problem. And uh, what we're hearing uh, is that um, a, a, a vaccine really is potentially on our horizon come the fall. Um, that comes from uh, uh, reliable sources. And I'd love to hear that that's a true story and we'll see in the coming months. But I would tell you that um, we're going to have to uh, use our heads and moving forward. We know that travel and face-to-face -face is necessary. It's hard to look at your partners and say, uh, I made a $20 million commitment and I never went and visited the company. So uh, it's, it's going to be a challenge in due diligence. It's going to be a challenge in closing a transaction. Uh, so we are going to have to address it. And I think when we do, we'll just try and be uh, as systematic as we can about it. Uh, try and pick um, uh, airlines that are following good safety plans. Try and make it as infrequent as possible and be thought about, thoughtful about it when we do do it. Thank you, John. Um, I'll say that we use Dynamo. Um, Dynamo. If I were to make a recommendation to folks, I think if you have a small team, um, I would go with Deal Cloud. Um, and I think if you have a larger team and you have resources to right size your CRM, I would highly recommend Salesforce. It's the best CRM um, in the market. 
Um, as far as hobbies go, I have a seven month old daughter. <laughs> so my favorite thing to do is to take pictures of her and to take videos of her. Um, and I'm really enjoying and, and just taking advantage of this time I get to have with her. Um, and then as far as getting on a plane, um, we had actually booked a trip to Hawaii over 4th of July weekend. And um, if they do, if they remove the mandatory quarantine, I think we may still go. Um, but it's, it's TBD. Um, I just, I, we just don't know. I, I'm a little bit freaked out now with all of the riots that have been going on, that there might actually be a spike um, in COVID cases. Yeah. Tom? So yeah, we're, uh, we're a Salesforce group. I uh, have been for a number of years. It's a great platform. We do see, however, that some of our portfolio companies, the operators, are actually moving off of Salesforce and trying some other things that they're, they're finding very successful. We have not spent any time to, to go and re review that. Um, in, terms, in terms of the, uh, uh, the hobby question, uh, we have uh, personally, we, we bought some antique 18th century doors, uh, French doors while we were uh, living in Chicago. And we've been in the garage on the weekends uh, uh, refinishing those and they're coming along quite nicely but still have a little ways to go. Next time I'm gonna be on a plane, uh, we have a, a uh, add-on that closes uh, here shortly and probably before the end of the month, I'll be on a plane to go, uh, uh, to go see the portfolio company. Thank you, Tom. Breed? My uh, hobby is um, family tree. So I'm going to show you yeah. my, my grandpa did this and he passed away in the 70s. And my dad and his brother were not really active on this. So I've kind of, and this is just one family tree. This is me right there. And it obviously goes back to like 1700s. So um, that's just one line. And I'm finding a bunch of old family pictures and I'm calling aunts and uncles and trying to figure out who's who. So that's kind of a big project that will take me many years, but at least I started it. Um, and then uh, there's a deal that we're closing that teams are flying next week to Texas on. So other people are traveling, I'm not. Um, I'll probably be willing to get on a plane sooner, but since my wife will have final vote on that, it'll probably be later. I don't know. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, I would say I perfected my mushroom risotto to a level that I'm not sure I'm gonna order one in the restaurant anytime soon. I love food and I like, always like cooking, but you know, finally I picked that up. And plane, I have no idea. You know, I've been on a plane once a week on average, for many years and now I'm not sure it may be end of August if things come down I got already I'm gonna get fired I think um, but I'm gonna pass it to Lena we're gonna wrap it up thank you all huge thank you for your participation and I know many people on this call are joining us for deal connect event you can start moving to that but Lena you want to take over wrap it up yeah, really quick just want to thank everybody uh thank you lou for leading the way and to our panelists thank you all for participating uh i think this was an important conversation given the times i do want to alert everybody to the two upcoming webinars that we have next week you'll see that here on your screen uh two interesting panels that we have next week so definitely take a look at those and sign up if you can join us as lou mentioned for those of you that are participating in deal connect now's the time to log out of this one and log into the other link that terrence circulated if you have any questions or issues with that uh reach out to anyone on the team and, and we'll be seeing you all soon until then uh stay safe and uh, we'll see you at the next one thank Thanks, you guys everyone. thanks all thank you.